Greetings. Before we continue with our journey, let's read from Proverbs chapter 8. It says here, Does not wisdom call, and does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way, at the crossroads she takes her stand, beside the gates in front of the town, at the, utterance, at the entrance of the portals she cries out. Father, as we continue our little journey, let us gain this wisdom, Lord. Let us not pass by and ignore it. In Jesus' name we pray this, Father. Amen. Great stuff, folk. So on the next uh, part of the journey, we'll, we, we're going to be dealing with forgiveness. Up to now, we've, we've, we've dealt with rejection. We've dealt with judging others and forgiveness. This is this part of the journey under the social heading of so, uh, our social life. In Colossians 3 verse 13, it says, Bearing one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. In the last chapter, you learned about the damaging effect of living in the judgment cycle. When you choose to judge people, they feel rejected. When you choose to remember that Jesus died for them, you can accept them in spite of their faults. This chapter that we're going to be dealing with now will illustrate that you can experience freedom through forgiving others. Do you have feelings of anger? Do you have feelings of resentment or hatred towards someone who has hurt you? Do those feelings torment you? Learning how to truly forgive will set you free. Here's a question. How would you describe forgiveness? Think this thing through before uh, you continue with the journey here. Forgiveness is not simply trying to forget. It is not just letting some, letting some time pass after an offense happens. It is not disregarding the wrong another person has done against you or even pretending that an offense did not matter. This is not true forgiveness. And you will not experience freedom. In the next sequence of uh, diagrams, we're going to lay this out for you. This is the prison of unforgiveness. The hurts you have experienced from others could be one-time offences or repeated wrongs done to you. The person who has offended you may or may not even know that you were hurt, regardless of how the offence happened or who did it. If you don't forgive, you will never be truly free. Your offender was in the wrong, but you are the one who ends up in bondage. You'll see this in the sketch below. He has a question. Is there someone who has offended you that you have not forgiven? Who is it? This prison of unforgiveness has four bars. The first bar of the prison is the offense. This is the wrong the person did to you. What was the offense the person committed? The second bar here is the hurt. This is how you felt emotionally as a result of the offence. You may have felt betrayed, embarrassed, rejected, belittled, unimportant, depressed, angry or devastated. Question is, how did you feel about the offence from the previous question? What were your emotions? The third bar to the prison is the ramifications of the offence. This is how the offence affected your life afterwards. The offence is like a rock thrown into a pond. The hurt and ramifications are the ripples into the other areas of your life. Ramifications of an offence may affect your relationship with God, your mind, your health, your relationships, your finances, your marriage and your children. For example, if someone stole from you, that would be an offence. The hurt may be feeling, you may be feeling cheated or betrayed. The ramifications may include not having enough money to pay your bills and having to take a second job. The fact that you have to work a second job takes time away from your family and causes problems in your marriage. All these ramifications happen because someone stole from you. Question. What are the ramifications of the offence you previously listed? 
The ripples from the offense continue to grow larger and larger over time, folk. Again, we look at the sinful reaction in the next diagram. The fourth bar of the prison is your sinful reaction. These are the wrong choices you made as a result of the offense. You were wronged, but did you react in a sinful manner? This would include gossip, slander, rejecting and judging your offender. It could also include wrong choices you made long after the offense. For example, perhaps you were sexually abused as a child. The abuse was the sin of your offender, but you may have gone on to make sinful choices yourself. These sinful reactions might have included sexual promiscuity, not trusting anyone, or substance abuse. What were your sinful reactions as a result of the offence? You may have built your prison of unforgiveness to protect yourself, but the bars keep you bound to your offender. How do you forgive an offence when you know someone must pay? Jesus' payment for all, for all sin. God does not forgive sin by pretending that it did not happen or ignoring it. He sent His only begotten Son to pay for that sin. God made the forgiveness of sin possible through the blood of Jesus. God requires the shedding of blood for any offense or for any sin or offense to be forgiven. Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Jesus became the complete payment for sin. His blood was shed only once, but was powerful enough to cover every sin throughout all the ages. In John 1 verse 29 it says, the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Here's a question for you. Does the blood of Jesus take away your sin? Explain. Another question. Is the blood of Jesus powerful enough to cover the sins of the person who offended you? In Isaiah 53 verse 6 it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. God accepted Christ's blood as payment for all sins. If all offenses were paid for by what Jesus did on the cross, his blood is potent enough to cover your offender's sin against you. Your offender may still need to receive God's forgiveness or be legally responsible for what he has done or what she has done. But as far as you are concerned, he or she is no longer guilty when you forgive. Jesus tells a parable about a king who forgave a servant of a great debt. Later the servant wouldn't forgive the smaller debt of a friend. Matthew 18, 32-35, and I read, says this. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison until he had paid every penny that was uh, every penny that he owed. That's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters in your heart. Come on, folk! Come on! Why do we have to? It's another. It's another weight on our shoulders. Unforgiveness. Just another weight. We carry it around with us all the time. It's always there at the back of the mind. We can release that. Forgive. Question. What is the reason the master gave for expecting the servant to forgive? Jesus' parable of the unforgiving servant makes the point that God's children are commanded to forgive because God has forgiven them. True forgiveness is choosing to accept the blood of Jesus as the full payment for what your offender did. Choosing to forgive is an act of your will. Forgiveness is not based on your feelings. Question. What is keeping you from forgiving your offender? The Bible gives the account of Joseph in Genesis 37. He was wronged and offended by his brothers. They threw him into a pit and sold him into slavery. Joseph experienced tremendous hurt because of his brothers, but he forgave them. When he was eventually reunited, with him, he treated them kindly and said, and this is in Genesis 50 verse 20, As far as I'm concerned, God turned into good what you meant for evil. A question. Can God turn what has happened to you into good? Romans 8 28, it says this, 
And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. You may be trying to protect yourself or get revenge by choosing not to forgive. Nevertheless, as you have seen, you become the one in bondage, not your offender. You become the person in the wrong when you do not forgive someone who has offended you. Ephesians 4 verse 32 says this, Be kind to each other, tender heart, tender tender hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. What does this verse say about forgiveness? God wants to heal your hurts and set you free from bondage, folks. In the next diagram, you will see this. Notice that the keys to unlock the prism of unforgiveness are in your hand. There are four keys. The first key is forgive the offense. You choose to forgive the person for the wrong that he or she did to you. Remember you are accepting the blood of Jesus as full payment for what the offender did. You are choosing to no longer hold them guilty for the offense. You may pray something like this. Heavenly Father, I choose to forgive and then you name that person for what he or she did to me. Be specific, folk. I believe the blood of Jesus covers their sin. The second key, forgive the hurt. After you forgive the offense, take the time to forgive all the hurt feelings you have experienced. I choose to forgive him or her for the feelings that I experienced because of the offense. And again, be specific and list the emotions you experienced. The third key is forgive the ramifications. By this, you choose to forgive the offender for how the offense affected all other areas of your life. And you pray something like this, I choose to forgive him or her for all the ramifications and list them caused by the offense. Key four is repent of your sinful reactions. You repent of your own sinful reactions in such a way by saying something like this, Lord, I acknowledge that I have sinned too. I confess my sinful reactions and be specific about it. Thank you that the blood of Jesus covers my sins and that I am forgiven. Question, folk. Are you ready to be free from the prison of unforgiveness? Take time to make the following lists. List the offence. Number two, list the hurt. Three, list the ramifications. Four, list your sinful reactions. Now pray and use the four keys to forgive your offender. Make a habit of forgiving. You may need to go through this process many times if you are in, the, in a relationship where there is a regular hurt or offence. Peter came to Jesus and asked in Matthew 18, 21 to 22, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. After you have chosen to forgive, you are free from the prison of unforgiveness. In Colossians 1 verse 14 it says, God, Jesus, has purchased our freedom with his blood and has forgiven all our sins. Christ's blood frees you from the punishment of your sins. Christ's blood is also the basis for forgiving others, which frees you from the prison of unforgiveness. Lastly, folk, as you use the fourth key, repent of your sinful reactions, you may have seen ways that you have hurt others. The question is, have you been someone else's offender? Who is it and what did you do? Matthew 5, 23 to 24 says, So if you are standing before the altar in the temple, offering a sacrifice to God, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there besides the altar. Go and be reconciled with that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. Part of being reconciled to others is seeking forgiveness when you have wronged them. Even if their wrong seems bigger, you need to take responsibility for your own unkind words and actions. Seeking forgiveness is seeing how you have hurt another person by your words or actions. The other person has been offended by what you did, not by what you were thinking. Your sinful thoughts about that person are between you and God. Repent of those to him. Going, going to or calling that person, be sure you have completed the process of forgiving that person before you go. 
that usually lands up, if you haven't done that, it usually lands up in arguments and battles and who said what again. Saying I was wrong for what I did, mistake your offence, would you please forgive me? Doing everything that you can to make restitution. For example, if you stole something, pay it back. It might mean being willing to rebuild trust and show yourself as reliable. Fifth point and final one, responding quickly. Don't let this thing grow a beard or fungi and algae. It just grows old and the older it grows in your mind, the bigger it gets, the more problematic it gets and so it does in the other person's life. Romans 12 verse 18 says, Do your part to live in peace with everyone as much as possible. Father, we thank you. We thank you for sending your only begotten Son, Christ Jesus, Lord, to come and show us the way, to die on the cross for us and shed his blood for us, redeeming us, buying us back, and then uh, uh, raising up, victorious over death, giving us eternal life in him to you, Father. We thank you for this. We pray now that we will get that boldness, Lord, that strength that only you can give us to go and ask for forgiveness where it's required. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.